Mark Wilkins. Uh, Mark Wilkins is an historian, writer, and museum professional. He is the current curator of maritime history at the Calvert Marine Museum. He has been director and curator of both the Cape Cod Maritime Museum and the Atwood House Museum, or Chatham House Historical Society, and has worked for the Smithsonian and Mystic Seaport. Mark is an accomplished model maker and boat builder. Mr. Wilkins is a published author of books and articles relating to maritime and aviation history. He is a contributor to both Aviation History Magazine and Air and Space Magazine. Mark Wilkins has a master's degree in history, both from Harvard, or not both, but from Harvard, excuse me, the low light, and is currently working on several books re uh, relating to World War I aviation, and is serving as historical consultant and producer of aerial effects for the Lafayette Escadrille, Escadrille documentary film. <laughs> also, something else he just did uh, and just finished this last week, is, uh, I believe, teaching his first course on maritime history with our very own Captain Will Gates, uh, Historic St. Mary's City, over at St. Mary's College. Uh, so that was nice to, uh, of, of Mr. Wilkins to help out in that endeavor as well. So without further ado, I uh, welcome our speaker. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. I'm very delighted to be here tonight, uh, beautiful Historic St. Mary's. So. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Sparrowhawk, which um, is arguably the oldest extant shipwreck in America, wrecking in 1626. I became fascinated with this artifact uh, when I was uh, living and working on Cape Cod. I went to the Pilgrim Hall Museum, and you know, the, the usual sort of um, Pilgrim sort of objects and artifacts and paintings, the sort of Pilgrim story, but there shoved away in the corner was this thing that looked like a, like a dinosaur skeleton. And I was like, what is that? And went up to it, and um, nobody was really painting. It was covered in dust, and the little tiny yellow warped placard uh, sort of introduced the story of the Sparrowhawk. And um, so I became fascinated with the artifact and its story. So this led to um, this little book that I did in uh, 2011 on it, um, which basically took the artifact, contextualized it, and sort of tried to reconstruct uh, what the vessel looked like, or may have looked like, uh, based on the artifact and period track. So um, I think we should just get started here. Yep. Um, so to give you a little context, um, forgive me if you already know this stuff, um, sort of England's Atlantic ambitions, uh, yeah, during the uh, 16th century was to break into Spanish trade networks. Um, it was largely unsuccessful. And an attempt to find a shortcut to the Orient or the Northwest Passage. And of course, the, um, the thing is finance, basically, to uh, reinfuse England's economy with gold, silver, or new commodities. Um, yeah, part of the allure of the Americas was the impression that the Pacific was just over the mountains of Virginia. So not so much. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so a failure to break into the Spanish trade networks in the Caribbean, and able to find the uh, Northwest Passage. England made its Atlantic debut by piracy. Sir Francis Drake, uh, one of many such legalized uh, pirates um, under uh, Elizabeth, first American colony in Roanoke, was a strategically located base for privateering. It was close enough to the uh, Spanish silver and gold trains to strike, but far enough away to sort of mitigate reprisals. Um, so the lost Roanoke colony, right? Um, yeah, Tudor preoccupation with Spain. Elizabeth was obsessed with this. Um, uh, the New World, uh, supported by the Crown by mainly way of charter grants and ships, um, at this point unwilling to commit any large um, amounts of capital to, um, you know, the, the new ex exploration efforts in the, in the New World. Um, most of the funding was up to the private joint stock mer merchant coalitions. Um, so yeah, she was fixated on the threat of uh, the invasion by the Spanish by the, via the Armada, uh, which combining with other uh, reasons turned her attention to Ireland, which is kind of the back door to invasion uh, for England. So this wonderful painting showing Elizabeth with the uh, Armada out there in the channel, and of course, uh, I think the Armada wrecking on the right-hand pane there, uh, which was the outcome. So um, England basically, you think of like ideology concerning uh, colonies or colonial endeavors, um, it's kind of like got her uh, feet wet with Ireland, the, the, the uh, Plantation pro projects in Ulster and Munster, um, and Excuse yep. Me. You can't hear. Okay, let's try this. How's that? Is that better? Sorry. Okay. 
All right. So um, based on the fact that, that Ireland was this sort of backdoor to invasion, the Royal Navy was kept close at home uh, and was unable to sort of enter into the Atlantic experience um, as it might have had, had not this threat been uh, sort of imminent. Uh, so the privateers, uh, like Drake and others, waged unofficial war on Spanish seafaring. So plundering, um, trying to uh, capture prizes, that sort of thing, uh, was the way that England sort of made its debut into the Atlantic experience, all right? Uh, and here's a map showing um, the, uh, the Ulster and the Munster plantations in Ireland, and again, this very problematic and contentious uh, sort of endeavor for England. Um, so. So Elizabeth dies in 1603, James I ends war with Spain, tries to unite England and Scotland. You know, J James was Scottish, so he, when he inherited the, the throne, he was excited because he thought, wow, the, you know, I'm Scottish and England has a lot of money, but then he quickly realized it really doesn't. The crown was basically uh, almost bankrupt. Um, so these Munster and Ulster plantations were begun as well as, importantly, Jamestown, all right? The promise of new markets and a bastion of Protestantism was envisaged for these uh, efforts. Um, again, the shortcut to the Pacific was kind of the icing on the cake. Um, and in interestingly, England thought of colonization as a directly westward endeavor, okay? Um, the most important thing here is by 1604, the woolen trade, which England depended upon for her economy, was clearly depressed. So it need England needed to find, they didn't have a choice, they needed to find new markets and new com uh, commodities to reinfuse uh, the, uh, the economy and, of course, the crown, royal finance, which would become a big problem with Charles. Um, so after James' death in 1625, Charles assumes the throne, implements higher taxes, rebellions break out in Scotland, Ireland, religious issues, England moves towards civil war. So many inhabitants of England, Scotland, and Ireland turn their gaze to America as an alternative because England is in such turmoil. This notion of um, constitutional monarchies and, you know, Charles was a very stout um, you know, mar monarchist, I guess you would call him. He was, it was, it was about the, the right of the king and, of course, this led to him losing his head. Uh, 1649. Uh, so what was London like in the 1620s? It was becoming, you know, England in this period was sort of in a dynamic sort of uh, phase of consolidation. Um, sort of uh, rural agrarian uh, efforts were being sort of um, slowly abandoned and due to plagues and other uh, enclosure movements and so forth. Uh, and England became this sort of dynamic force drawing people in from um, far, far reaches and became this hub of mercantilism and political power. It drew many working poor, which of course fueled the plagues, right? Um, the jobs were very scarce, didn't pay much. Uh, again, the lackluster economy, England struggled with the notion, is it really reformed enough, right? This leads to the, the pilgrims, um, the shining city on a hill in America. So the colonies, were they a land of opportunity or dumping ground for ex excess populations? Well, they were kind of both. Um, you know, um, people that plague fraught England with very poor living conditions, squalid living conditions, and very few jobs, looked at America as something that might be a little bit better than what was going on in England, all right? It's just a map of London at the time with the Thames and the, the various um, shipping that you can see in there and sort of the town with its various gates, walled city, um, very different from what it is now, but again, it's, it's still there. So importantly, we're getting to Sparrowhawk, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> 1626, uh, the seminal track, John Smith's General History, comes out, which basically is an idealized portrait of Virginia, a place lacking industrious people. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the prospect of indentured servitude did not seem bad, uh, yeah, when compared to what was going on in England. So there they are. There's Elizabeth, there's James, there's Charles giving the, this track their good housekeeping seal of approval. It must be true. Um, so here's, a, so of course, some very key quotes uh, from that tract. Uh, Heaven and earth never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitations were it fully manured and inhabited by industrious people. Now let's take that uh, phrase and just, so England is giving itself uh, basically license to colonize, to um, uh, basically inhabit America because it's lacking industrious people. And of course, this goes back my goodness, this goes back to a concept uh, co-opted by the Romans, res nullius, which means that to own land, it must be worked. These people were not working the land, therefore they did not own it, right? This is core English ideology for sort of uh, what happened in, in the colonies. 
and this, the better sort used large mantles of deer skins, not much differing in fashion from the Irish mantle. So England's saying, okay, look, we did this to Ireland, and it worked, sort of. Um, so we can do this here, right? Because they're just like the Irish, and we colonized them, and th that worked out so well. <laughs> anyway, and of course, providence. You see, by what strange means God still hath delivered it. So providence undergirded most everything at this period, all right? So, origins of the voyage. Late fall of 1626, yeah, a small group of London merchants decided to embark on a voyage to Virginia. The destination was Jamestown. We don't know what port they sailed from, probably Dartmouth, Portsmouth, um, Plymouth. I mean, there's a lot of uh, southeastern uh, coastal towns. This is a lovely painting in the collection of the Pilgrim Hall Museum by uh, Wilcox of Dartmouth Harbor. And there in the center, I don't know if I have a pointer, but th there's Mayflower in the center. And to the left of her, that's sort of bisected by that small mast of that boat in the foreground, that vessel is about the size and rig of what I think uh, Sparrowhawk would have been, maybe a little larger, um, but a very a small uh, ship-rigged vessel. Okay, All right. and this is, by the way, if you ever are in the vicinity of uh, Pilgrim Hall, you can see this painting as well as Sparrowhawk because she's back. I, I brought her down when I was at the Cape Cod Maritime Museum and installed her there. That's at the end of the talk, but um, she's back. And they still don't have much plans for interpreting her or displaying her. I mean, I, I think she really belongs at the Smithsonian. I mean, it's one of the oldest. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. All right. So who are these people that sailed on the, on the, on the voyage? Um, the entire passenger manifest is not it's not known, but there was a Captain Fells, John Sibsey, several Irish servants, and a Captain Johnston. So you basically had the ethnic and social stratification and hierarchy present in England on this vessel. You had your English nobles at the top, uh, Irish below, and Captain Johnson. I think he may have been a Scot. I'm not sure. Br Governor William Bradford described them as a rowdy bunch, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, they were very, very um, charismatic, full of life, um, vibrant people. Uh, you'd have to be to do to risk one of these voyages, right? And yeah, uh, as I mentioned, the, the ethnic uh, hierarchy. This painting by uh, Franz Halls of the Laughing Cavalier, painted in 1624, is kind of a nice sort of suggestion of what these people may have been, you know, full of hubris, full of themselves, and thinking that they could go across the Atlantic and conquer this new land and find fortune, because you certainly couldn't get it in England, right? So, and why, especially Virginia at this time, you should know this, tobacco, right? Uh, Virginia Company collapsed in 1624. Uh, the governance of Jamestown was assumed by the Crown. Importantly, um, also at this time, the Powhatan Massacre of 1622, when England decided they're no longer gonna be evangelical with the native peoples, it's gonna be ruled by the sword. So with this comes the British Army to help uh, protra you know, quell protracted disputes with native peoples. It's also brought regional stability to the area, the British armies here, um, to sort of make it more uh, attractive for potential colonists, um, entrepreneurs, and to keep that cash crop coming. So land grants were an added incentive for settlers, and there's the sort of um, illustrations of Jamestown at the time, all right? Yeah, so um, mid-1620s, tobacco trade in Virginia was becoming very, very profitable. It was a high-value, low-volume commodity, so that as such, it was ideal for shipping, right? Because you could pack a lot into a hogshead, put it in the, uh, the hold of a ship, and um, made these voyages very profitable. Yeah, J James I disapproved of the use of tobacco, but he loved how it reinfused royal finance in his own coffers, right? And yeah, I mean, he, he basically passed or enacted legislation in Parliament to say that um, a percentage of the tobacco trade was to go to, 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 the, to the crown, basically. So he loved the tobacco trade, he really did. So uh, the voyage itself, uh, like Mayflower Sparrowhawk was bound for Virginia and was blown off course. You know, they toyed with the southern route, which was safer and slower, but they took the northern route, which was quicker and more dangerous. Um, Passengers, <coughs> excuse me. Sack, I'm gonna drink a water here. All right. So we know from Bradford that the passengers and the crew had run out of food, water, beer, burned all their extra wood to stay warm. They were, uh, Johnson was sick with the scurvy. They were desperate to, um, to reach land of any, any measure. This is a, a diorama that I built um, and photographed to sort of give you a suggestion of what that voyage may have been like. Um, so just, uh, just anyway, so yeah. Um, desperate to land, basically lost off the Grand Banks. So not a great place to be lost. Uh, so this is a great quote by William Strachey, 1609. Uh, and it just sort of sums up the, uh, the power of the sea. I mean, the people were not prepared for this at all, right? They, they, 
in, in England where you have the channel and sort of coastal waters, you're not gonna experience that savage fury of the North Atlantic, especially in winter. So prayers might well be in the heart and lips, but they drowned out in the outcries of officers. They are louder than the weather or our office. Nothing heard that could give comfort, nothing seen that might encourage hope. It's impossible for me, had I the voice of stentor, an expression of as many tongues as his throat of voices, to express the outcries and miseries, not languishing but wasting his spirits, and art constant to his own principles but not prevailing. It's a mouthful. Um, anyway, so what's he saying here? Not languishing but wasting his spirits, and art constant to his principles but not prevailing. They're doing their best, but it's just not enough to compete with the savage fury of the North Atlantic, especially with these vessels and their lack of preparedness for what they were gonna actually experience. I mean, as we said, these, a lot of these tracks that are being published, like by John Smith and others, are skewed, heavily skewed, pro-colonization. It's, it's, you're gonna love it, it's a land of milk and honey, you're gonna make a fortune over there. You just have to get over there, but they kind of blew this part off. They didn't really talk about the voyage so much and how dangerous it could be. Spencer, um, all th through his uh, poetry, you see again this notion of the great sea puffed up with proud disdain to swell above the measure of his guise is threatening to devour all that his power despise. So basically the sea is something that man cannot triumph over. It's a, it's a, a dynamic, all-encompassing force and you'd better respect it and this is what he's going. So um, yeah, and Spencer ba both rationalized and promoted the Tudor claim to the British Empire, the first notions we have of British empires are sort of in some, uh, alluded to in the writings of Spencer. He traces the line of British kings from Brutus to Elizabeth, making the Atlantic experience the final inevitable chapter in a succession of progressively imperial events. So it's England's manifest destiny that's gonna cross the Atlantic and colonize America. That's, this is what these tracks sort of undergird and uh, uh, promote, all right? Shakespeare, again, um, I won't skip the two first quotes, but th this last one from The Tempest is awesome. When the sea is hence, what care these roars for the name of a king? King might have sovereignty on terra firma, but at sea, he's powerless, just like everybody else. So this was kind of a game changer for the English, um, where they were so uh, heavily uh, vested in sort of this social hierarchy and this right to rule and all this stuff. The Atlantic experience really kind of changed those that experienced it, I believe. All right. Yeah, so lost off the sea at the Grand Banks. So what happens, she, she uh, sets her anchor, the an anchor ca uh, cable parts, um, Sparrowhawk, um, goes through a cut on the outer shore of Cape Cod, through a little, and this cut has reappeared today. I don't know if you can see in that picture, there's a little um, dark space between those two bars, and that's about where she came through. Um, so she rode a storm surge, she ground up as she did, uh, springing a couple planks, uh, came to rest on North Chatham, and yeah, she had, the, the, the tracks indicate that she had sprung a couple of her planks below the water line, so she was making serious water and people were starving to death and like drowned rats on the shore, but they were grateful to reach the land. Um, so, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, what did they organize, what were they thinking? I mean, how did they run out of food, provisions, all of this stuff? I mean, did they fail to plan or plan to fail? So if you use the maps uh, that are available at the time, it's very distorted in terms of the distance to cross the Atlantic from England. Uh, you see in that lower map, um, it looks, and then the scale of the boats, it looks like it's just a hop across the pond to get to America, when in fact it's very, very different, okay? Um, so, uh, the, the maps kind of, uh, they didn't really have good information, um, certainly didn't have any of the wonderful modern things that we have these days for uh, navigation, so um, you could easily, easily imagine that it might take only so long, but then, you know, contrary winds, storm surges, all kinds of stuff um, would sort of uh, conspire to make that not possible, all right? So Governor William Bradford's journal has a very good, uh, well, uh, probably some of the only information about these guys. Um, Bradford came down, actually he was greeted by native, they were greeted by native peoples who were, um, uh, they were surprised that they spoke English. They said, are you, you know, you want Plymouth or broken English, but they basically said there's a colony up there, should we go get the governor? And they said, please. So they went off in a uh, dugout canoe and brought Bradford down. Bradford brought corn, he brought spikes, he brought oakum to help them repair their vessel, which they, they did. They, they reseated those planks, caulked them, spiked them, uh, but they wrecked it a second time. These guys were just, it wasn't their day. So um, Bradford said, fine, you know, game over. You're, why don't we come up to Plymouth Plantation and we'll try to fit you in as best as we can. Um, so it was winter of 1626-27. They were given a plot of land to work because 
Um, they were sort of twiddling their thumbs, like, what do we do? Uh, John Fells, yeah, he wanted a girlfriend and got one. The, the thing was, um, yeah, he was accused of uh, getting a, preg a servant girl pregnant. He denied it, and then she began to show, right? So Bradford said, that's it. He said, <laughs> you guys have to go. Um, <laughs> apparently, there were other instances where you know, carousing and drunkenness and all kinds of wonderful stuff. So um, were they a rowdy bunch or were the pilgrims an uptight bunch? I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> it's probably a bit of both. Um, so yeah, uh, summer of 1626, Bradford says, get out of here. So he put them on a, a couple of small boats and they finally completed their voyage down to Virginia. And actually, uh, John Sibsey, we have pretty good documentation. He um, became a wealthy tobacco uh, merchant down there. He helped build one of the first churches in the Norfolk area and uh, became actually a magistrate. And so he actually kind of did okay. Uh, we don't know much about what happened to Fells. He may have gone back to England. But these two, we do have a fair amount of information on, which is fascinating. So he kind of got his nascent American dream, and John Sibsey did. And that's interesting. I, w I went uh, to the National Archives in Kew Gardens in England to do research for this book. And I found some land grants that Sibsey had uh, in England. I think it was Somerset. And um, it wasn't much, so I could see where he thought, well, I'll sell this and f to fund this voyage. And that was kind of my, my extrapolation from that. So anyway, um, other accounts of the wreck from early 17th century were Morton and Prince, who basically just copied Bradford's account. Morton did note that the captain was named Johnston. That's where he got that piece of information. So Sparrowhawk uh, gradually disappeared as the shifting sands of the Cape covered her over. Um, the name of where she wrecked was, was named Old Ship Harbor, and it's been that way since the 17th century, and she would not reappear until 1863, so right in the middle of the Civil War. Okay. So basically on the 4th and 6th of May in 1863, the sands, as they do so often on Cape Cod, revealed this wreck and uh, after a great storm. And this was chronicled by Amos Otis, and his description provides, yeah, some very interesting insights into the vessel. Um, you can see this drawing that he made. Now, interestingly, the amount of futtocks in this, futtocks are the timbers that uh, frame a ship, um, that you can see in there, they're, they're very, very, a great quantity, much more so than the original artifact. So it makes one wonder how much of this artifact that we have is actually, you know, accurately reassembled. So, um, yeah, 53 futtocks in the Otis drawing um, more than double the amount of extant uh, futtocks. And also, importantly, the position of, Futtock is a, um, it's a curved timber that's used to frame the boat, okay? I won't call it a frame because they were floating frame uh, at this period. We'll get to that in a little bit. But um, anyway, so the position of the mast step is very tantalizing because it, it, if you take it for, you know, at, at face value, you could conclude that <coughs> the vessel would had a, uh, a mainmast, probably a foremast, probably a mizzen, so ship rigged, okay? And... So yeah, 1865, a guy by the name of Leander Crosby and Charles Linnell paid to have the artifact um, removed. Um, they carted it up, uh, a couple of guys named Dolliver and Sleeper carted it up to Boston Common, mm -hmm. where they reassembled it. And I love this picture. That, there it is. That's, that's uh, Leander Crosby at the uh, stern post there. And you can see, I don't know if you can see the shadow of the photographer in the foreground. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So this is early morning. And that's Boston Common, and he thought he would um, sell tickets and make a fortune off this great curiosity. And there's one of the tickets, actually, that's in the collection of Pilgrim Hall um, for this thing. And there's, you know, very fanciful accounts of the day of people breaking timbers off and carrying them away and poking at it. With st I mean, it, this is before the um, great uh, reverence that we have for antiquities now, especially after, say, the, the King Tut find in, in 1913. But um, this was very much artifact as curiosity. It's kind of a, you know, a wooden freak show. And, um, uh, you know, th it's also interesting, too, that at this particular time, 1865, right, the conclusion of the Civil War, this was brought up to Boston Common to remind a very much fractured nation that we had original, you know, roots as one people. So this was kind of the thing with, with this the symbolic gesture of bringing Sparrowhawk up to Boston Common to kind of remind people that our roots go way back and that we are, in fact, one people. So um, that was the aspiration anyway. <laughs> so this is a uh, plan view or a profile view of the artifact. And one thing you should notice right off the bat is those, those boat builders out there, the very sharp deadwood area there by the stern, very, very sharp, meaning that most of the um, 
upper body portion would have had to flare out radically to support the, uh, to, the positive flip buoyancy on the stern, making, making, makes it difficult to interpret what the vessel looked like. So um, I tried to stick to um, period tracks and period treatises on shipbuilding as well as artwork. All right. So there were a few attempts. D.J. Lawler, who was a Boston naval architect in 1864, um, this is his uh, interpretation of the artifact. Oh yeah, okay. So um, the extant portion of the vessel, whoop, no, oh, geez, now I've done it. All right, extant portion of the vessel would be right in here, okay? So um, very high sweeping uh, ends on the vessel um, and uh, fairly large depth of hold. And this is the deck and the bulwarks right here. So um, this was, and basically from his sketch, we get these basic proportions, 40 feet length overall, 12 foot 10 beam, nine foot 7.5 depth of hold, um, which seems fairly consistent with a lot of the tracks of the time. Charles Livermore noted that she had ballast and as such may have been deeper or more heavily sparred than um, say a catch or a bark or something, a pinnace, something like that. She had a small permanent cabin aft, a plank floor of a ballast uh, for the cargo and passengers, forecastle and companionway forward with a galley uh, decked with bulwarks uh, or open rails and it did have a boat, a ship's boat amidships. There were limber ropes and holes in the floors, which are, if you know what a limber hole is, it's a, a notch cut in the floor so the water can flow through. And the limber ropes, you work them fore and aft to keep those clear, okay? So these are all interesting notations that these people made about the artifact when it, when it sort of surfaced in, um, in 1863, okay. So just some of the scantlings. The keel was of en English elm, 28.5 in length, molded eight, sided six. Um, so molded means wide, sided means deep. Uh, floors were about seven feet long, molded seven, sided six. Uh, planking was eight quarter, two inch thick, uh, 10 inch wide oak and was charred in places, which is a typical, before steam bending, they, they charred timbers to bend tight curves, right? They threw them over a fire, charred the inside, and while they're still hot, bent them onto the framing. And there was a mixture of trunnels, um, oak and um, locust and iron drifts in assembling the artifact. So it's kind of an interesting uh, mixture of fasteners. Um, here we go. Hobart Holly was another person who interpreted the wreck, and this is a little drawing that he did. Um, he was a, it's, in, it's important, when, when anybody's interpreting anything, including myself, it's like you have to factor in your lens. How, how are you viewing information? What is your sensibility? What are your norms? This sort of thing. So he was a 20th century uh, designer of merchant vessels, and if you look at that uh, midship section there, looks very much like a merchant vessel of this period. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, right here. Versus um, something that Baker, I think this was William Avery Baker's drawing of um, one of the, maybe, maybe Mayflower, using uh, fragments, uh, Matthew Baker's tract, very different uh, vessel. So um, this is his little drawing that he came up with, which I, I don't know, it's, that doesn't, doesn't look like, doesn't convince me that that's what it would have looked like. Um, so. So I would turn to uh, draw, uh, various drawings, engravings um, of the period, and um, most of these vessels, even the smaller ones, like, like this little guy, um, show the, soar the soaring stern castles, ship rigged usually in some fashion, uh, bowsprit, latin rig mizzen. Um, it's just, there's just tons of um, drawings of this, such that even if, I mean, you have to qualify it by saying, well, artistic license, right? They may have been exaggerating, but if, Say 10 different artists all draw both the same way, well, that maybe gives it a little bit more credence. And this is kind of what uh, I found. Vasa, a contemporary of Sparrowhawk, pride of the Swedish Navy, <laughs> capsized and sank in 1628. Uh, her design was inherently unstable, but she also had the, uh, the high top sides, um, uh, just like the, the drawings that you study. And this, this in itself is an interesting story too about how little or poorly understood stability, center of gravity, all of this were at this time. I mean, the Mary Rose, the Vasa, um, you know, top heavy, and the gun ports are about 16 inches uh, from the water. So if she healed, well, boom, that's what happened. And 
Actually, this naval architect quit, but the king said, no, you will finish this boat or I'll cut off your head or some other punitive action. And so he did, but he said, you know, this boat is not going to be a good boat, and sure enough. <laughs> so uh, 16th and 17th century uh, text on naval architecture, the, the biggest one being fragments of ancient shipwrightry by Matthew Baker, notebooks of John Hawkins, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth's slave trader, also um, Hawkins rebuilt the English fleet before the Armada to make it more weatherly, the race-built galleons, this is all Hawkins' work. So he has a lot of in insight and input into this period and the notebooks of Peter Pett. So all of these uh, tracks provide useful information to reinterpreting um, the artifact, okay? So, yeah, Matthew Baker, his fragments, it's a fascinating tract. Um, and um, his formula were basically paraphrased by William Avery Baker, who designed Mayflower II. Um, to make it much more readable and accessible to people like me who, uh, you know, this is, wow. I mean, he spent a good amount of time uh, sort of contextualizing this and sort of boiling down these uh, formula that you could basically build boats. And it was very formulaic, in fact. Um, Strachey notices, or notes that, um, I forget which tract it was, I think it was only wrecked on Bermuda, that they built a pair of pinnaces in maybe three to four weeks just using these very simple formula and tables combination of sweeps, arcs of the circle, and then rising and narrowing lines, which to connect the, uh, the various sections. So that's basically what I did with Sparrowhawk. I measured the uh, compass timbers of the floors and basically got a radius that I was able to project up to, um, to get the various shapes that were then plugged into these formula. And this is kind of the derivation of that using those arcs and the rising and narrowing lines. And that's the midship section right there. Um, maybe it's a little, th that's more probably aft than forward, uh, showing the stern castle. So, um, and that's kind of what I sort of envisaged the rig would be like. Um, there's that midship mainmast, a very small single sail foresail, um, sort of the, uh, I don't know, there may have been a spritzel, who knows, it's such a small boat, it doesn't seem likely, and then a lateen mizzen. All right, so. So Pilgrim Hall, uh, this is where the artifact uh, lives and where it lives now, but this is what I, when I was telling you earlier about uh, becoming fascinated. I was uh, the director and curator of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum, so I begged them to let us borrow uh, Sparrowhawk for about five years, and they agreed, because basically it wasn't, it wasn't fitting in with the Pilgrim story, just like, just like then, just like now. <laughs> So um, uh, their curator and myself pain, painstakingly disassembled um, the artifact. And as I mentioned, the frames are not contiguous. It's not like a, a sawn frame boat, a modern boat. The frames float within one another. So um, there had to be this cradle to orient the timbers relative to the keel. Uh, so basically, each timber was marked um, as to its location. and corresponding mark on the cradle so we could take it apart very carefully, bring it down to Cape Cod and then reassemble it. And that's just what we did. Uh, we were so excited because, you know, finally we could re return it to Cape Cod where it wrecked. So that was the big marketing piece for that. But um, yeah, there you can see we, the basement of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum had all the timbers. And then this is the reinstalling it in the museum. Um, and it has some fascinating construction details. These uh, grown crooks are half lapped onto the keel and spiked with iron. Um, and um, what else does it have? The, the whole uh, forefoot and stem are missing. So it's, it's kind of hard based on, you know, this was built many, many, many years ago. I think in the, um, well, after Leander uh, Crosby and Charles Linnell had it on Boston Common, there was debate about what to do with the artifact. Finally, the Massachusetts Historical Society decided it should come to Pilgrim Hall, right? Because this was like the only act in town for the Pilgrim story. So that's what happened. I think that was late uh, 19th century that it came there. And this cradle came with it. So whoever kind of put the vessel back together um, fashioned this cradle. And um, so we don't, I mean, it's a, reasonab it's a reasonably good, um, uh, sort of re reorientation of the timbers based on, say, the Otis drawing or some of the other drawings. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's mainly speculation, I think, uh, as to what the vessel really looked like. Yeah. So you can see that's a very good um, view there of sort of the interior. We didn't have enough room to put the port side um, first futtocks. These are the floors in here and then first futtocks here. And you see it hasn't quite 
it hasn't quite reached its uh, maximum beam. But um, as, as I mentioned, uh, projecting out the arc of the circle, it matched up almost exactly to what Lawler had uh, specified, about 12 foot beam at its widest point before planking, okay? All right. So finally, significance. Um, just a few points, um, this notion of, you know, the uh, diversified and pious North and the corrupt slave-ridden South. You know, this is the same old story that finds its way into many, unfortunately, many American uh, texts on this period. But what Sparrowhawk does is it kind of reintroduces a level of nuance and complexity that may not be present in, in, in a lot of tracks on the Great Migration. Um, these guys were kind of a hybridization of sort of this pious pilgrim and this tobacco, you know, money-grubbing entrepreneur. They were kind of both, uh, as evidenced by John Sibsey, who was pious and a good business person and actually a good civil servant. Um, so, and yeah, the Atlantic experience, I mean, really, we think about taking that voyage um, from England and sort of your mindset before the voyage, during the voyage, and after the voyage. I mean, you, you had to be changed when you finally set foot on America, I think. All right, well, I think that's about it. Um, are there any questions? Yep. How many people on the boat? How many people on the boat? We estimate about 24 to 25. That's all. Well, yeah, I mean, you know. I tell you, what are these guys thinking? Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yep. Well, that's a very... No, that's a very interesting point. I mean, basically, there's a pretty good uh, paper trail about, um, you know, okay, so to answer your question, um, he said, what's the scientific evidence to support this is actually Sparrowhawk? Well, there was a professor at Harvard named Dr. Agassiz who basically took the Bradford's journal and he extrapolated the position from the journal uh, based on geologic uh, evidence and and this Portominicate it was called Portominicate Harbor where this thing was recorded as, as being and um, there was a rough approximation there's a period drawing I didn't include in this talk and I should have a notation of where the vessel was he basically extrapolated that this was the artifact that is is recorded in Bradford's journal and it's a it's a tedious process that he went through but people you know come to, gr to agree that this is the fact that the the artifact that uh, Bradford mentions and um, Sparrowhawk, that name does not exist in any port books or any documentation that I could find um, of this size vessel. Um, there's Sparrow, there's the Hawk, there's a lot of different, you know, there's no real record. It was kind of a, a vernacular uh, term that sort of was used to refer to this wreck over time. I mean, there was Sparrow's, there was a man by the name of Sparrow in Chatham that whose property this vessel was on, so that was the, the, the prefix, and Hawk, uh, wild speculation as to where that came from, but this is what it basically uh, came to be known as. To answer your question about, um, we tried to uh, uh, see if we could do dendro, you know, dendrochronology on the wood. Uh, we couldn't, the museum wouldn't allow us to cut or core sample any of the timbers, which is unfortunate. Before I left the Cape, Woods Hole did s say, well, we can do C14, you know, carbon dating on the artifact. But um, they said, based on the age of the vessel, it would have to be much older to make C14 uh, truly accurate. It's gonna be just a, just a wild scope of uh, times it could have existed based on it being 1626. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they told me. <laughs> um, so, other questions? Yep, in the back. Was this style of boat commonly used when they got going back and forth? Another fascinating question. I mean, that sharpness to the deadwood area by the stern, it almost looks like Basque influence or something else. I mean, it, it's anomaly. I mean, Otis and others that noted the wreck were noted how finely fitted the timbers were such that even though she was heeled over to port when she was unearthed, her hull was very, very symmetrical, very finely built. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the notion of the timbers being English elm and English oak makes us think they came from England, but even that, you could, you could argue that based on importation of timber elsewhere, it could have been built elsewhere, it could have been built in France, could have been built in Holland. Um, it's just not enough information to really make you know, a conclusive uh, statement about it. But um, I don't know, I mean, 
based on Baker's uh, formula, that, that stern is kind of an anomaly. Based on what Baker's, um, let's go back. Mm, yep. Baker's, uh, you can see the um, stern area here. It's pretty full. Now rising up, it's going to get sharper, but, and then there's your transom. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to know where, where that influence came from. Um, so, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Uh, what style of ship turned into the common freighter, like a merchant vessel? Yeah. Well, like you, you know, English, you know, urgent, English merchant vessels of this period, um, you know, the, the ship rigged vessels, um, that, yeah, that, those were, it's a slow, slow progression from, um, this sort of floating frame vessel to the sawn frame uh, vessels of, the, say, the 17th and 18th century, 19th century. Um, I'm sorry, the 18th and 19th century. Um, it's Sparrowhawk is just this. It's kind of like an anomaly in the history of shipbuilding, in my opinion. And there's some things that that definitely uh, hearken to um, what we know about uh, from Baker and, and other other people paintings. Um, but I say, as I mentioned, there's 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 stuff about it that just is very unique, and I don't see any documentation based on the fact that there just aren't that many shipwrecks in existence, except for maybe the Mary Rose, um, which is a very different vessel um, and from an earlier time period. So it's hard to know. Okay. Other questions? Yep. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. The, the, the typically, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, you see, I don't know what the percentage is, but let, let me just say this, that you see a lot of vessels that are entered in port books leaving England, and they don't show up in America. So they get swallowed up in the same, vice versa, leaving America for England, they don't show up. And it's like, we're, okay, lost at sea. Yep. yep, 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 weather was terrible. I mean, based on the way these ships perform, if you ever read... Uh, the, the chronicled Alan, Alan Villiers' voyage of Mayflower II across the Atlantic. There's just wild stories of the, the bowsprit just moving like a, like a broomstick back and forth, and his crew's terrified. And it's like and this is a this is a sawn frame vessel, Mayflower II. I mean, they started building her um, floating frame style. There's a picture in Baker's book of her starting that way. They have the first floors, uh, or the floors located on the keel, and, they, and they're, they didn't really know how to proceed, so they built it sawn frame because it's sturdier boat. Yeah. All right. Sixteen twenty-six. Winter. Yeah. Yeah. On the northern route. On the northern, on the northern route. Yes. So. Nope. Nope. We don't. We don't. We just have Brad Bradford's journal and Prince and Morton. Their chronicle of the wreck. <coughs> so we know it arrived, but again, we don't know from which port it sailed. Um, most likely, so, so, you know, southeastern England. Mm -hmm. Yep. How were the timbers conserved? Well, that's an interesting story too. We um, I looked through the um, conservation record that Pilgrim Hall had, and <laughs> in a word, not very well. Um, they used um, some crazy potion um, in the 1970s. It was like acetone and, I don't know, beeswax and gasoline and all this stuff. I'm just like, what is this? And, um, you know, PEG or polyethylene glycol was not used on the thing. That being said, these timbers are dried all the way through and kept in a climate controlled environment. So some of the timbers had a little, were a little punky, had a little bit of dry rot in them, but by and large, pretty darn tough, pretty, pretty, pretty tenacious wood still, even today. Um, I'm hoping that Pilgrim Hall can finally maybe try to date it uh, through Dendro or something else, um, but I don't know. I don't know. Yep. What percentage of timbers were recovered? Maybe less than 25%. Yeah. Other uh, questions? Yeah. Much more than that, yeah. A lot of lot of voyages, leaving and back and forth, and down to Bermuda and so forth. I mean, it was very very busy. Okay, so um, I don't have a specific number for you. Will do you know offhand? It, no, it was probably a bit over 100. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, 
Because remember, the, the situation in England was desperate, uh, especially for these um, working class poor. Uh, this was like indentured servitude, you know, work five years on a plantation, pay back your voyage. This was kind of a good deal based on plagues and all this other stuff in England. So it's kind of like, like the only option for many people. So hop on one of these boats and go over, yeah. Other, yep. Mm -hmm. You would think, wouldn't you? <laughs> they did. Actually, a lot of these captains were return captains. Like Fells, uh, we think that he had made several voyages before he took Sparrowhawk over. So, you know, they could have, again, navigation was in its infancy, as we know it today. So they could have thought that, you know, they had enough supplies, but they may have been lost for a long time or blown off course and... Contrary winds, they may have, you know, spars may have fractured, sails torn, I mean, all kinds of stuff at the height of a gale. I mean, it's, it's, it's an awful proposition by any stretch of the imagination. So, but yeah, they did talk to each other. Um, and many of the captains were repeat captains. So, um, I guess, I don't know, I guess they thought it, it doesn't matter. We got to go, guns to our head. Yeah. Mm hmm. You mentioned some of the factors in the. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, so they're still up yeah. In yeah. Yeah. They yeah. They are. <sighs> I think they were headed. Yeah. Drifts. Yeah. With like a, a cupped, uh, like a like a rove over it. Yeah. Um, but very sparing. Most of them were trunnels, and the trunnels are still there. They're still good. They're wedged on the. Well, you can still see them. Yeah. So and all of the. Um, they haven't really done it, but all of the planking has the trunnel holes and all of the futtocks have the trunnel holes. So it'd be a great exercise for somebody to start matching up the planking. I think it's only been displayed with the garboards installed. Uh, in that was the extreme. They didn't put any of the other planking on, which um, there's lots of it, like stacks of it. Uh, I, was, I was strongly advocating, can't we just take a, you know, a foot of this and have it analyzed? And they're like, no. So mm, politics. Anyway, so uh, yeah. Uh, other questions? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, it's just, you, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know, maybe, I know. These are just stabs that people were taking at this thing to try to try to get more data. But like I said, Woods Hole was willing to, who he was willing to do C-14 dating, which they, even though they said it was going to be perhaps wildly inaccurate, at least could be somewhat, you know, give us a sense of what we're talking about. Was it older than that? Because it's interesting. Otis's track talks about this too. He says when the ship emerged, it looked like something that was just like, just out of outer space or something. It was just such a weird shape. And he describes this shape quite in detail. He talks about it quite a bit. Uh, that, that's, that sharp stern area and the finely fitted, I mean, he had, um, as I mentioned, those, those frames floated within each other, right? So if this is the uh, floors and these are the futtocks, they floated inside of one another and then they were chalked up with what are called gluts, little wedges that were wedged to, to make that contact, make that tight so they wouldn't move around too much. So this is a whole other interesting thing, like how was it built? Um, probably the, the floors were, were laid first and then some planking to which the first futtocks were attached and then ribbands or other planking, maybe a center mold. Um, it's just the possibilities are endless as to how these vessels were built. Um, but it was a, it's definitely a definitely, you know, a sensibility and an art that's seemingly lost. I, I just, it just gives us a tease or a little hint of what it might have been like. So, anyway, um, yep. Uh, what the draft was? I didn't, I didn't do that. No, depth of hold was about nine foot seven. So, what do you think, Will? Maybe eight feet, seven feet. Yep, yep. And remember, she's heavily ballasted. That was noted too. So whether she had a soaring rig or a larger rig or she was much tubbier than, um, you know, again, we, we know that the stability at this period was very much in question based on Mary Rose and uh, Vasa and whatnot. They just didn't have a handle on that yet. So... Uh, could have been, could have been quite a high, high-charged vessel. We just don't know. Yep. Another question. 
Yes, some of the ballot, well, this is a great vernacular story. So on Cape Cod, you know, if you work in a maritime museum, which I have, um, seemingly every week somebody comes into your office and plops down a rock and says, this is part of Sparrowhawk's ballast. And <laughs> yeah, and you have to, yeah, oh, that's fascinating, awesome, you know, and piles of it in the back, anyway. Um, yeah, it's a piece of granite, all right. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's another thing. This, this wreck has sort of taken on a mystique. Um, everybody thinks they have, you know, the, the, the missing link that's going to solve the Sparrowhawk riddle on Cape Cod. People are like, you know, I have. There was actually, I didn't mention it, but there was an elm uh, pump that uh, was recovered, and that's in the uh, permanent collection. It's about, uh, I'd say, about eight or nine inches in diameter, so not a very big pump, but... Um, uh, there may have been two, one on either side of the keelson um, for the vessel. Yeah, and there's a few other things. They found chicken bones. They found uh, mutton bones. They found um, uh, clay pipes, so smoking. So there are some um, ephemera and artifacts relating to the passengers, which is kind of neat in Pilgrim Hall's permanent collection. But again, this is, a, this is, an, art this is an artifact that just begs to be properly interpret interpreted on a national scale, I think. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> uh, other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>